All right, folks, welcome to the final session of the day. I'll be chairing it. Uh, our first speaker is Lucas, who will tell us about uh, solving CHT, CHCs for ADTs. Take it away. Hello, I'm Lucas, and I'll be giving this talk on solving constrained horn clauses over algebraic data types. So the first order of business is to explain why we would want to solve constrained horn clauses over algebraic data types. And so the reason why we do that is for safety verification. Basically, we want to be able to mechanically synthesize a proof that nothing bad ever happens, with bad being a user-defined property. There are two general approaches to safety verification. There is an automatic approach, which is, um, basically you just press go and it generates your proof for you. Uh, examples of this would be Elderica, CVC5, and Spacer. And then we also have manual safety verification tools like Coq, Agda, and Isabel, which require uh, full user participation. Our approach is kind of in between these two. And specifically, what we try to target is complex data structures. They're common in programming, but difficult for safety verification. And the reason for this is because these structures can be unbounded, and many algorithms that work with these structures are recursive in nature. And so our goal here is to do verification over recursive functions over unbounded structures. So a motivating example. So on the right, I have defined some Haskell code that basically just appends two linked lists. Um, it's divided into a base case, which is the second line, and an inductive case, which is the last line, which has a recursive call, and the first line is just a type that we have for annotation purposes. And we also define the function for reversing a list. Um, we once again split it into a base case and an inductive case. And suppose that we want to prove the safety verification problem that I have highlighted right here, which is basically that um, reversing the append of two lists is exactly the same as appending the reverse of those two lists, except that we invert the order of parameters. Uh, there are a number of issues with this, like I've said before, that reverse and append are recursive, and lists like this are unbounded. So what we try to do is we want to come up with an encoding for these structures. And so for that, we use an algebraic data type. Formally, we say that an ADT is a tuple where in the left compartment we have a sort symbol s, and in the right compartment we have a set of uninterpreted functions that we call constructors. Now, importantly, this is what a constructor would look like, and the output type is exactly the same as the symbol s. And uh, we say that an algebraic data type is inductive if one of the, these two constraints holds for each and every constructor in our set c. It is a base constructor, in which case its type is just S, or it is an inductive constructor, in which case we say that one of its input types is the sort S. And so an example for lists is this. We've defined nil to be the base constructor and cons to be the inductive constructor. And so this completely defines a linked list. Uh, and here's an example of how we would actually encode a linked list. It's just a sequence of applications of these functions. And so now that we have an encoding for structures, we want to create an encoding for programs. And to do that, we use systems of constrained horn clauses. And this right here is a canonical example of a system of constrained horn clauses that represents a transition system. The first uh, line here is what holds in the initial condition, or in our particular situation, it's the base case of an induction. And then the next line encodes how we transition from one state to the next. In our, um, our formulation, this corresponds to the inductive case. And we also have a user-defined query that we want to make sure holds in all states. Uh, you may notice that we have this italicized INV um, name, and that's just a placeholder for something we call an inductive invariant. 
Now, an inductive invariant is simply an interpretation for I and V that makes all of these um, clauses true. Uh, this interpretation should is really an over approximation of reachable states, and it is precise enough to prove the unreachability of the error state. Uh, the last line here I added to indicate that we can actually have more constraints than just what we see here, but this would be you know, a canonical example of one system. So let's talk about some terminology of a CHC. So this uh, would be just one of them. Uh, the antecedent of the implication is called the body, and the consequence of the implication is something we call the head. Uh, we should note that this formula is implicitly universally quantified. Uh, we call the symbol phi a constraint. It's just a simple formula in first-order logic. Uh, the symbols R0 through RK are uninterpreted relations, i.e. placeholders. And then finally, uh, the head is either an application of one of these placeholders or it's the constant false. Uh, but one CHC on its own is not very interesting. We can sort of trivially construct an interpretation for just one of them. But when we have a whole system of them, we can actually you know, verify useful things. So some challenges for automated verification over algebraic data types. So like I said, the theory of ADTs is undecidable in general. And this is because ADTs are unbounded structures. So if you were to use uh, something like Z3, and try to have it prove a um, universally quantified formula over an algebraic data type, it would end up just enumerating all possible lists, which it can't do because there's an infinite number of them. And so uh, because it's undecidable and these structures are unbounded, occasionally uh, the user will have to specify extra properties, uh, which we call Eureka lemmas. Now, some challenges that are specific to solving CHCs over ADTs is that CHCs uh, over ADTs will require recursive invariance. So I mentioned before that we have this invariant and we want to create an interpretation for it. Uh, in a more traditional setting, that interpretation would simply be a formula in first order logic without recursion. But because we're dealing with algebraic data types, we need to have recursive invariance. And that, uh, because we're working with the input relations R0 through RK, uh, these are just relations. We don't quite know what the output or inputs of them are. It's um, not a function is what I'm trying to say, or not a function that's not a predicate, I should say as well. So our general approach to solving these challenges is as follows. We want to try and synthesize recursive inductive invariance. And we do this by transforming a subset of the CHCs to recurrence relations. Uh, we start by identifying the inductive input arguments. And then we identify output arguments. And then we instantiate uninterpreted predicates with equalities. And this equality in particular is between one of its outputs and some function that we're trying to create an interpretation for. Then we propagate these equalities until we reach some fixed point and we can't apply uh, quality propagation anymore. And then at that point, we should have a set of recurrence relations and we should invoke an off the check solver or an off the shelf solver to check validity or progress. Uh, we call these structural induction solvers. Um, and these things are able to synthesize some lemmas on the fly, but like I've said, they can't do all of them. So here's an example. Going back to our motivating uh, example, we have the append function. And we're going to try to translate this into a system of CHCs. So the first thing we consider is the base case, which is this guy. And its corresponding CHC will look like this. The append function has been turned into a predicate, so it needs uh, three arguments. And then in the body of the CHC, we just have that xs is equal to nil. And that is what we would call the inductive input argument. And then we move on to uh, the inductive case, where we have um, the output symbol zs and the input symbol xs. And we say that the predicate app held 
for the tail of Xs and the tail of Zs, which would be Xs prime and Zs prime. And then that should imply the append of Xs, Ys, and Zs. And then similarly, we can go through the same process for reverse. Uh, but because the reverse function depends on the append function, we also have to include its definition. So here's the inductive case of reverse. And then finally, we want to be able to translate the assertion, which is this at the bottom. And this is our complete system of CHCs for our motivating example. So like I said, we want to try to synthesize recursive functions over this. So um, in the example from the previous slide, we should synthesize two recurrence relations or two recursive functions. This would be the function for append. And then this is the function for reverse. And the algorithm should ultimately choose its interpretation uh, that Zs, which we've said is the output, is equal to the uh, application of this new synthesized function between Xs and Ys, and we also have the conjunction for the same thing for the reverse function. So I mentioned that we do this by applying some semantics preserving transformations. Uh, the first and more, most important transformation is something that we call equality propagation, or EQ prop for short. It says that if we have an equality in the body between A and B, and an instance of B occurs in the head of the CHC, then we can remove the equality from the body and substitute B for A in the head. And the second uh, transformation that we have is the new fun transformation. This basically transforms one of our predicate uh, symbols for a corresponding equality with a function symbol. If you specify an argument i, it moves the ith argument to the left-hand side of the equality, removes it from the body of the application, and then substitutes uh, for a new function. Uh, this, this rewrite rule is valid if and only if i is, in fact, an output argument. Question? Um, static transformation. Yeah, we, but we also do this incrementally. So um, you, you'll see. I'll go through an example of our algorithm actually being applied. So now we get to the core algorithm. As input, we should get a system of CHCs. And as output, we should get either satisfiable or unknown, and if we get a satisfiable result, we should also give the user the interpretation that we came up with. So the first thing that we do is we order all of the predicates in the CHC by dependency. So for example, the reverse function depends on the append function, so we have to do the append function first. And then we also create a new formula called lemmas, and we instantiate it to true. Now, what we want to try to do is find the input arguments. So we start by looping over all the predicates in order, and then we construct the set rules, which is basically just the, all of the bodies whose head is R. And then we apply equality propagation until we reach a fixed point. And then from that point, if this succeeded, we should have an in inductive input argument. If it failed, then we just have to return unknown and we can't proceed anymore. Uh, but once we have our inductive input argument, then we proceed to create a subset of the rules that are definitions, and we create a new symbol for our interpretation, i of r, and we set it to true. Now we're going to try to find the corresponding output arguments. So uh, we start looping over all of the um, all of the numbers between 1 and the arity of r, but we skip over i, which is the inductive input argument. So first, uh, we should try to apply the new fun transformation for j, and then compose that with a quality propagation that we apply until we reach a fixed point. And then once we do that, we should have a set called c. And then outside of c, we can pull out this um, equality between a function and we just say that's our interpretation, or we can join that with our existing interpretation. 
And then from that point, we want to try to val validate this. So we once again consider the set of or subset of rules that are definitions, but this time we substitute the interpretation for the relation. And then what we do is we uh, conjoin all of the elements of rules t prime, and we also quantify all three variables to get a new formula d, and then we ask if the lemmas that we've had already conjoined with d implies the rules under the interpretation i of r. If that is the case, then we simply add d to the list of lemmas, but if it's not, then we return unknown. And once we've gone through all the predicates, we should have a full interpretation for our program. So then we invoke an ADT solver and ask if the lemmas imply the query, which uh, we once again supply its interpretation to the query. If that's the case, then we return sat, but otherwise we return unknown. So, I mean, that's a lot of abstract information and a lot of really intense detail. So let's go through an example of what this actually looks like in practice. So if we consider just uh, the append function of the constrained horn clause, or system of constrained horn clauses that we've constructed earlier, um, the first thing we do is we apply the new fund transformation. In reality, it will try to do this many times to come up with the interpretation, but for the sake of argument, we've, we've already figured out what the output arguments are. So once we do that, we start to apply equality propagation. The first equality we see is that excess is equal to nil, and so we substitute nil for excess, and that removes all equalities from um, the first constrained horn clause in the system. Now we begin to do this for the, base, uh, the inductive case, and we just apply equality propagation over and over like this, and then finally, we've reached a fixed point, and what we should have at this point is a recurrence relation. Uh, the algorithm will then proceed to do the same thing for the reverse function. So, some implementation details. Um, our tool accepts SMT lib to format as input, and only the theories of LIA and ADT are supported at this time. Uh, we've mentioned that it connects to two backend solvers, ADT-IND, which is our in-house solver, and Vampire, which is the state-of-the-art solver for algebraic data types. Um, the backend solvers deduce lemmas, and that these lemmas are then communicated back to ADT-CHC, which is our tool. And this is uh, what that looks like as a diagram. Okay, so now we're going to talk about ADT-IND, which we've re-implemented for ADT-CHC. This is our in-house induction solver, specifically for quantified formulas over ADTs. So it's a backtracking rewriter, and it uses both forwards and backwards rewriting. Uh, forwards rewriting is sort of the intuitive notion of rewriting where you take a goal and you simplify it using a fixed set of rules. Um, Backwards rewriting, on the other hand, uh, is just modifying the list of rules so that in the future, um, the rewriting or the forward re rewriting process isn't uh, isn't as constrained. And ADTIND uses Z3 in the back end. So we generate lemmas in ADTIND by analyzing common subterms. So because it's a backtracking rewriter, it produces this tree structure of its exploration of a particular goal, and if it finds that it gets stuck at a point, then it moves through its history and tries to find common patterns. And if it finds these common patterns, it might try to prove them as just standalone theorems, um, or it might try to generalize by uh, replacing those common, uh, common subterms with new variables to create a more general formula. And uh, once it has generated a lemma syntactically, it, it doesn't really know if that lemma is true or not. So what it does is it creates a recursive instance of itself to verify the lemma. Uh, but that's kind of a problem because it's a very expensive uh, thing to do that. And so we have implemented a filtering procedure that can quickly refute lemmas. 
And so I'm going to talk more about this filtering procedure. Uh, when we're given a lemma and a set of assertions, the first thing we should do is generate a set of ADT literals. And then uh, we should substitute each, uh, each quantified variable in the goal for a literal until we get all possible permutations. And then we unroll using the assertions until a fixed point is reached. And then we should send the negation of all of the unrolled lemmas to an SMT solver. And then if the result is sat, then the candidate lemma could be wrong or spurious, in which case we just sort of ignore it. So for example, if I have the definition of reverse in the first two lines, and in the last line we have a lemma, which is that for all x, the reverse of x is equal to x, which intuitively is not true. So the first thing we should try to do is generate literals. Uh, we just generate three of them. It can, this can get into state space explosion problems real quickly. So then we substitute them in for the quantified variables, removing the quantifier. And then we apply the definition. And then finally, we negate the formulas and send that to the SMT solver. And it should correctly point out that the last formula here is satisfiable, in which case it would say, OK, let's skip this lemma. So evaluation, we evaluated our tool on 71 benchmarks that we divided into three seats, suites. The ADT IND suite, which is our in-house benchmarks. And then we have the CLAM suite, which we got from that paper. And then the Leon suite, which we got from that other paper. And then um, we reported four series of experiments. Uh, one with ADT IND with no lemma filtering, and then ADT IND with lemma filtering. And then uh, we experimented with the vampire solver with two modes, portfolio mode and structural induction mode, which forces um, vampire to use structural induction. And we found that overall vampire with structural induction does the best in terms of coverage. Um, in aggregate, all of all of, or the, the aggregate of all of our results, we found that we solved 73% of benchmarks, which is a lot better compared to the existing, or the second place option, which is Alderica. So here's some of our evaluation data. S means satisfiable, U means unknown, and what I want to point out is that ADT IND is substantially faster than Vampire, but it, it's not as complete per se. So, in conclusion, we use semantics preserving transformations to perform functional synthesis. And then once we have performed functional synthesis, then we have to solve this using a structural induction solver, which handles lemma synthesis filtering and sometimes still needs Eureka lemmas. Uh, future work, we want to add support for nested quantifiers, uh, support for alternating quantifiers, and better support for lemma refutation. Thank you. Any questions?